A lot of people say to me, Father Adam, you're such a crazy guy. Why do you always tell jokes? And I say, well, because I have been touched by Jesus. And I have the joy of the gospel in my heart. I have the joy of the Lord. The Bible says all the time, rejoice always, says St. Paul. I tell you, rejoice. And if, and if the Bible emphasizes something, wants to tell it twice, it means it's important. So to be a happy person is what Jesus wants. To have a smile. Cain, in the first book of the Bible was jealous, and he murdered his brother Abel because the Bible says he was a depressed person. And when God speaks to Cain, he says, Why do you have such a gloomy face? Why is your face so depressed? Why are you so downcast? Look it up in the book of Genesis. Because the cheerfulness... Of the joy of the Lord has to mark our life. Every day I get up and I say what my grandmother does, which is, this is the day the Lord has made. Let me rejoice and be glad in it. And I put on a big smile in the midst of everything that is going on. And that's what you are called to do in your own life. I remember not too long after I was a priest, I was at a meeting with a bunch of priests and I was sitting around uh, at a table and one by one, there was like five of them, and they started saying, people say that you tell jokes. People say that you laugh and really loud and boisterous. People say that you do this and you do that. And I just couldn't take it anymore. I just couldn't take it anymore. And I got up and I said, listen, I can't help it that you're all, you're all, old and miserable and jealous. I can't help it that you're all old, miserable, and jealous. And I got up and I said, and I'm young and beautiful. So don't hate. Join in. Participate. Don't hate. Participate in the joy. Remember, when the leper in today's gospel is healed, Jesus says, don't go and tell anybody. And what does he do? He goes and he publicizes the whole matter, so much so that Jesus couldn't go into the town anymore because he told everybody. And that's what I always want to do. I always want to tell people how happy I am, how joy-filled I am, because Jesus has found me. I know the good news that God loves me no matter what. In all my past, with all my baggage, with all the sins, God loves me. Yeah, I'm a sinner, but God loves me. You know, I may have issues. I may have an eating disorder. I may feel fat and ugly all the time. I, uh, I may be struggling every single day to eat, but God loves me. Even though I have issues and I have problems. And God loves me and that's why I'm going to rejoice. I choose to rejoice. I do not choose to be down and downcast. I choose to rejoice. In spite of everything that goes on in our life, in the midst of a pandemic, we are called to get up every single day and to live our life and to look beautiful. I take a great example from my grandmother. First thing she does every single day, she gets up and she bathes and he, she makes herself up and it's very important for her to look good and it should be for all of us and to rejoice always. When Jesus said, go to the whole world if you are my follower, the ending line of the gospel says, go to the ends of the earth and proclaim 
the good news and announce the good news. When he said announce the good news, he didn't give people a Bible. As some people go, you know, from uh, one house to the other with a Bible. The Bible didn't exist until the year 385 when at the Council of Carthage the bishops got together and put together a document composed of many books that they said were inspired. And that's where we get the Bible. The word Bible means library. It is a compilation of many books now, there existed many other books that you could go to Barnes & Noble or on Amazon and get, like the Gospel of, Ma of um, Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of James, all sorts of different letters that exist that are out there, the Gospel of Peter, I mean, all sorts of things. Okay, And they have a lot of good things in them. For example, Dan Brown used those writings, we call them apocryphal writings, to come up with his book, The Da Vinci Code, because those different writings floated around in the early church and the different Christian communities like in, Carth like in uh, Carthage or in Antioch or in, in Corinth. The uh, second reading today was from the book of uh, St. Paul to the Corinthians. And uh, uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians or to the Romans and so these many different uh, uh, books existed in the early church and people were reading whatever they wanted and then the bishop said well no we need to come together and have one central document and that's where we got the bible but my point is that the bible didn't exist until like 300 years after Jesus left and when he said go and proclaim the good news he said what Go and announce me. I am the good news. Jesus is the gospel. He is the evangelion in Greek. The good news. And we are to be Jesus. That's why Paul says in the second reading today, he says, be imitators of me. Look at me. And he says, do not in your conduct offend anybody. But by your words and actions, Build up people and be imitators of me, says Paul. Because when you come into contact with me, you are coming in contact with Christ. That's why he says, it's Christ who you see when you see me. Read the second reading today. Do not offend people. When people come into contact with you, they should be coming in contact with Jesus Christ, with the good news. You are to be good news. And I got a question for all of you. Are you good news? Or are you bad news? Are you good news or are you bad news? When people meet you, do they meet a smile? Somebody that lifts them up with a joke? Somebody that is kind to them? That is understanding? Or do they meet judgment? Like so many times with religious people who think that they are better. The fact that you go to church or are baptized or are Catholic or... You know, uh, that you have faith in your life or that you pray or that you, uh, you, you, you have the, the rosary that you say every single day or all these religious things do not make you better. They only give you responsibility to be better, to be more loving, more accepting. People are going through so much, so much depression today. Since 2009, Yale University has done a study. Dr. Lori Santos there. She has something called the Happiness Lab. Classes that are free that I listen to and I recommend to all of you. And Dr. Santos, in her studies, in her scientific research of the phenomena in our country, the pandemic of depression that is going on, and suicide and anxiety, that the drugs that are most prescribed are for depression and anxiety, not for cholesterol or diabetes. We have a pandemic since 2009. The rates of depression have gone up by 50%. 11% of Yale students at this Ivy League University in the Northeast. 11% of them are suicidal. In high school, the number one cause of death is suicide. 
we have a pandemic. Are we as people of faith adding more baggage to all that people are already carrying with their problems, with their issues? Or are we helping people carry those problems, those issues, their suffering? Are we good news or are we bad news? Today we meet a man who is a leper. Leprosy was a skin disease. The first book that we read from today, the book of Leviticus says, if you had a stain on you, you were to go to the priest and the priest would declare you unclean and then you had to live outside of the outskirts, outside on the outskirts of the town or the city. And people would just throw things at you, you know, they would throw some piece of bread or whatever that they had left over. And you had to walk around always yelling, unclean, unclean. And people would never want to be near you or touch you because you were taught to be contagious. Can you imagine the solitude, the loneliness, the feelings of not being wanted, not being loved, the desperation in a leper? Somebody taught to be leprous and he was not to get near another person let alone a rabbi and a famous one like Jesus but what does he do he breaks the norms and he runs to Jesus he throws himself at Jesus's feet and says if you wish you can make me clean and Jesus touches him and says, be made clean. I do will it. If you will, you can make me clean, he says. And Jesus touches him. Now, Jesus could have healed him in many other ways, with a word or just with a thought. Remember, Jesus is God, but he touches him because that was important, because this man taught himself to be untouchable, to be unwanted. And Jesus touches him as he wants to touch each and every one of us that all have leprosy. Leprosy was a disease that would eat away at you. Slowly, there are things in you that are eating away at you. Your marital problems, your bills, your fear and your anxiety, the fact that you feel unwanted, your past issues, the fact that you cheated on your husband or on your wife, the fact that you were not the mother you wanted to be or the father you wanted to, me, the f to be, the fact that you did not pay attention to your children, the fact that you paid more attention to your work, working 14 hours, the fact that you made all these mistakes, that you f the fact that you had an abortion, all of these things are weighing on you, the fact that you were told when you were a, a child growing up that you're fat or you're ugly, the fact that you were bullied in school, all those things that make you feel like there's something wrong with you. You were abused. You were touched inappropriately. People violated you. You were raped. All these things happened to you that made you feel unclean. I will never forget a man who came to see me and he says, Father, you know, when I was in high school, I took a trip, a camping trip with my classmates. And I was sleeping in a tent and I wet the bed and the camp master, he took my blanket out and he showed it to everybody and said, Look, Jimmy, he wets his bed. I will never forget that. And he carried it the rest of his life. He felt unclean, like there was something wrong with him. Or the young man that I met in Las Vegas who... People go through all sorts of things in their life, identity crises, even sexual identity crises in their life. They're trying to come to themselves. And he came to the choir. He was a member of the church choir, and he came dressed as a woman one day with makeup on and everything. And the priest approached him and said, you are not welcome here. You can't be here. Get out, he was told. Leave. And he left. He felt unwanted. 
he felt like there was something wrong with him and he got himself into all these problems, going to bars and sleeping around. How many people have those things? What is the leprosy eating away at you? Your addiction, your casino addiction, your alcohol addiction. What is, what is it? Your depression. What is it that is eating away at you? Throw yourself today at the feet of Jesus who invites you with his opening arms open arms and says, come to me, all you who labor and find life burdensome, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. Jesus says to you, come to me, throw yourself at my feet. Admit that you have a problem. And name it. Anytime that Jesus heals somebody, he always wants to know, do you want to be healed? He asks people. What is it that you want me to do for you? Jesus asks when he is about to heal somebody. So that same question he is asking of us, he says, what is it that you want me to do for you? What is the leprosy? What is the sickness that you have? Tell me, and I want to do it for you because I love you. Why is it that he asks people to name what's wrong with them? Well, that's the first step of a 12-step program. First, you have to admit and name that you have a problem. If you are an alcoholic, you have to stand up at an AA meeting and you have to say, I am Jimmy and I am an alcoholic. I have an issue. And you have to admit that alone you will not get out of this problem, that you need the help of a community that's why alcoholics go to meetings like two, three, four, five times a week because they need the help of a community. They need one another and they, need, they, they acknowledge that they need the help of a higher power. If you have an eating problem, you go to Overeaters Anonymous. Or if you have an eating disorder, you go to those type of meetings. If you have a drug problem, you go to that 12-step program. If you have a gambling problem, you go to that. You get into a community and you admit that you have that issue and that you need help. You're depressed, you go see a doctor, you get medicine. If you need counseling for your past issues, you get help for that. And it hurts. When you have surgery, and I've had surgery in the past, it's very painful, the recovery after surgery. It's very painful. It's painful for me to admit my own problems, my own leprosy. It's painful for me to tell you that I have an eating disorder, that it's a battle in my life but it is a process of healing, seeking help, to confess. The Bible says in the book of James, confess your sins to one another. That's, that's a, so difficult to admit that I have a problem because we want to hide. We love to hide and we love to pretend. We love to pretend that we have it all together but we are all sinners so the bible invites us to be open about our issues i will never forget in 2013 when i was pastor in crescent city january 1st 2013 father eric freed was murdered and tortured at saint bernard's church in eureka the neighboring parish and i celebrated the 9 a.m mass in crescent city at the church i was at where i was pastor and i went home and my phone rang and it was the bishop and the bishop says quick lock your doors and don't come out father eric freed was murdered and he wasn't just murdered he was tortured we think there are people after there's somebody after priests the fear that was in me the anxiety the worry i even put bars on the windows. I couldn't sleep at night. And I shared this with people in the church. And I was told by one person after another the compassion sometimes that you get. Even in church. Um, amazing. I was told, Father, what kind of a priest are you? Where is your faith? How can you be afraid what kind of a priest are you? Instead of walking with me, 
validating my fear, trying to help me. I was put more down. Another person said, uh, one person that went to church almost every day, he says, Father, we don't air our dirty laundry in public. Well, maybe that's the problem with church people and in this institution that we have in the Roman church. That has been the problem. Not airing the dirty laundry and hiding it. Hiding your dirty underwear. Maybe that's the issue. Look at what we have done. Bishops hiding pedophile priests and abusive priests. Priests who abuse their power and other people. They have hid it for decades. And what have they done? They have morally bankrupted the church. Haven't they? By hiding. By not being transparent. By putting everything under the carpet. And that's what so many people do in their own lives and in their own families. What will people think? What do you care? What will people think? Do they pay your bills? Are they going to live your misery for you? Admit that you have a problem. And stop hiding. Stop pretending. I will never forget in 2009, I wasn't yet a, a priest. I was ordained a priest in 2010. And as a deacon, the first funeral I attended was of a young man who took his own life because he confessed to his parents that he was gay and his parents disowned him. Said, if you are like this, we don't want you anymore. How can we be around you and, and, and what will our brothers and sisters say and the grandparents, what will they say? How can we have a, a family reunion or, or, or a family dinner with you and somebody else. And he took and he, he went and he took his own life. The shame and the hiding. How many families are ashamed? They live in shame. They live in hiding. It's that scene of Adam in the book of Genesis when he's ashamed and he's hiding and God says, come out of there. Stop hiding. Get out of that hiding place. And he says, well, I was afraid. Stop being afraid. The Bible says 365 times the phrase appears. Be not afraid. What are you afraid of? Stop living with shame. We hurt each other. We hurt our families. All these children taking their own lives because they don't feel accepted and validated and heard. Stop hiding. Stop pretending. Yell like the leper did. Jesus, heal me. I am sick. And Jesus heals us. You know, if you had the declaration of leprosy, you had to live outside. In biblical times, sickness was a sign that you were a sinner. If you had a disease or a sickness, you were taught to have gotten it as a result of sin that you committed. And that made you ostracized, marginalized. Nobody wanted to associate with you. Hence, look at the first book today, of the Bible, the book of, Genesis, uh, the book of Leviticus. As long as the sore is on him, he shall declare himself unclean. Since he, has in fact, since he is in fact unclean, he shall dwell apart, making his abode outside of the camp. Let today be the day when I, a priest, and what did the leper have to do? They have to go and show themselves to a priest. When Jesus heals the ten lepers, remember only the one came back to give thanks to Jesus. That's in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Jesus says, go and show yourself to the priest. Because the priest would declare you clean 
and then you could be incorporated into the community. What happens when we are baptized? We are washed clean in the blood of Jesus. We are made clean. The blood washes us and incorporates us into a community. Baptism isn't just about washing us of original sin. Baptism is about making us part of a community for that's where the healing takes place. So let this day be when I extend my hands over you. I'm a priest, you know, and I extend my hands over you and I declare you clean. You are clean. No matter who in your life has declared you unclean, I declare you clean today and I incorporate you into a community. You who may be feeling, feeling sick, I incorporate you into a community. You know, recently somebody came to me and they said, Father Adam, I'm so depressed and I'm so lonely, but you know, I don't want to go to church. And I know what you will tell me, Father, that I have to go to church. Well, first of all, don't presume to know what I'm going to tell you, okay? Assuming makes an uh, out of you and out of me, okay? So don't assume. And I said, no. The word church comes from the Greek ecclesia, which means assembly, community, assembly and community. You can have this assembly and community at an AA meeting, like I told you, or a Narcotics Anonymous meeting, or a Overeaters Anonymous meeting, or the, the group for people with uh, an eating disorder that I attend. We have a community. We have church. I know people who play cards, even on Zoom, and they form a community. I know people who every day gather in Las Vegas on a Zoom meeting to pray the rosary. They have church. They have community. They have ecclesia. My friend uh, Jackie Call and her sister Nancy Call in Las Vegas are part of a dance club that is there. They have church. They may not go to church at an institution, but they have church there in the dance studio. They've met people there. They've made lots of friends. I loved going with them when they took me. It was wonderful. And after the dance, the dancing, we went to a next door restaurant and we continued talking and sitting around and having a glass of wine. It was wonderful. Get yourself into a community. You need community. That's where healing comes from. Health equals community. Get a walking partners. Why do people go to nightclubs or bars or casinos? They are looking for community. Jesus wants you in a community. Not necessarily in a religious institution, but in a community. That will bring you health. Now, you can be even in religious institutions or religious communities that will not bring you health. There are some Catholic groups that are fanatical and they do not bring people health. They bring harm. They destroy families. Other religious groups, like I will point out the Jehovah Witnesses, they separate families. You can't go to a birthday party. You can't do this. Don't associate with them anymore. Your mother dies, you can't uh, attend her funeral. I mean, how stupid. Be normal, people. Stop being fanatical. You know, I mean, what kind of a person would not let their child have a blood transfusion? So these are religious groups. And we also have them in the Roman church uh, that hurt people. There are religious groups that hurt people. Just being part of a religious group doesn't mean it's healthy. You have to get yourself into a healthy community. Use your brain for that, okay? God gave you a brain to use it. You have to be part of a healthy organization. Healthy, not an abusive organization. If you're going to a church that is abusing you, that is telling you, you know, not to associate with your kids or, uh, you know, the priest is spewing hate, out! Get out of there. I mean, why would I ever go somewhere where they treat me bad? I mean, come on. You know what? <laughs> Stop it. So this professor that I'm listening to 
Dr. Lori Santos from Yale University, and I highly recommend it. She gives great advice on how to get out of depression, anxiety, how to deal with this happiness gap that she says exists today. And she keeps giving wonderful research advice like, you know, exercise, eat right, get enough sleep, meditate, join a group, be more social, have more human interaction. And she still, and still, she gives this great, she diagnoses the problem and she gives you advice on how to get out of the problem. But she always keeps asking the question and I want to scream at my computer screen as I'm attending her classes. They're free actually at Yale University because she says, I don't know why this is happening today that we have so much suicide and the rates of depression have gone up 50%. And I want to scream at my, at my, uh, uh, computer. The answer. I wish she'd call me. <laughs> Recently, Gallup did a poll, and I put it up on my Facebook feed, that in our country, we have experienced a dramatic decline over the past year in mental health. And every group Every demographic group, like those who are 20 and under, those who are in their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, all these age groups, they have all seen a decline in mental health in all racial groups, all sorts of groups that were studied, except one group increased their overall mental health happiness. One group experienced a 4% rise, according to Gallup, which is the most trusted, researched, poll historically in the United States. According to Gallup, only one group experienced an increase of 4% in mental health, and that is those who go to church on a weekly basis. Hello? Woo! Father Adam, to all of you, light bulb, community, that's what brings health. The trend in our country in the last 50, 60 years has been for Americans to become more and more nuns. I'm not talking about nuns, you know, the ones who dress in the habit, okay? The ones from Sister Act, no, okay? I'm talking about nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, which is those who say they have no religious affiliation or church affiliation. The people who say, Father, I'm spiritual, but I don't need church. How dumb. You need church. Maybe not necessarily a religious church, but you need community. Stop this individualism. The rise of individualism is what has contributed to the decline in our mental health and so much suicide. We have become more and more individualistic. More and me, it's all about me. Me sitting there at my table when I'm eating and on my telephone. You know, I see that all the time in restaurants. People, you know, not talking to one another. It's all about me. Me by myself, you know. That has contributed to the most prescribed drugs around being for depression. So we need community. Stop with this, I'm, sp I'm spiritual, but I don't need community. Yes, you do. When you say, I don't need community, you will need more and more a psychiatrist and more and more drugs. Stop it. Stop saying you can do it alone. You can't. You can't do it alone. We need one another. Throw yourself at the feet of Jesus and confess what's wrong with you and then get yourself into a community and recognize that alone you can't do it. You need Jesus. You need the help of a higher power. We need each other. I need you. You need me. And that's how we get out of our leprosy as I bless you today and always with a smile for this Sunday. God bless you all.